Hi, Craig here from Arms and Armor and Secretary of the Oakshot Institute. And today I thought we'd do something a little bit different for our video. Today I wanted to show you one of the best parts of our job. I'm going to take you to school with me. I have the great pleasure to introduce you to an instructor who I've known since the late 80s and has taught me a great deal and is one of the important things about studying period weapons and armor for any scholar really interested in the subject. I'd like to introduce you to Moonbrand. Listening to what a piece can tell you is the best way to truly understand an artifact of the past. A combination of science, connoisseurship, thoughtful study, and critical thinking are all vitally important to understand a piece like Moonbrand fully. To understand medieval swords, one really needs to look at the piece, but also, if possible, hold the piece at least look at it, interact with it with a third dimension available so that you have an understanding of not only the shape of it, uh, the heft of it, but the thicknesses, the nuances, how it was constructed. All of those are incredibly important things for understanding any medieval weapon or armor. Moonbrand is the archetype of the Type 14 blade style in Ewart's typology of medieval swords. You can see the broad blade, the fullers running about halfway down the blade. Here, four parallel ones. You can be just a single fuller. A blade that is relatively thin in, in construction. This has a hexagonal cross section, though a diamond section is, a, is seen on most. And it comes to a nice point. The type 14 blade type is the last of group one in Ewart's typology. These are the earlier, thinner blades. As blades transition out of this period, they seem to get thicker and stiffer and are probably designed to interact with the plate armor that was evolving at that time period. Almost all 14s will have kind of a slightly curved guard, a relatively beefy grip that's a little bit over three inches, maybe almost four, and oftentimes have a wheel pommel. In this particular case, the K-type with that flat, broad wheel that we'll look at a little more closely in a bit. These exceptional swords were swords that you see in art. Uh, oftentimes people refer to these as being very similar to the one shown in I-33. And it is a sword that is exceptionally good at cutting, but any kind of combat really. Uh, as we've shown in some of our other blog videos and such, having a thin sword does not mean you can't thrust with it. One characteristic of the Type 14 is the fuller. In this case, we've got four parallel fullers coming down the blade. They end in kind of a rough pattern, but not exactly where each is. This could have been done with a forging tool or also a shaped grinding stone would work to create this kind of a pattern. An interesting aspect to this sword are the marks that are in the central two fullers. These could be indications of a forge or the maker of the blade in a sense, but that is not always the case. Modern mindset gets that, oh, maker's mark, these are all forged by this person or that person, and that's not how the medieval sword industry really worked. These are probably much more indicative of who paid to have it made, or what armory they are in, or who commissioned the group of blades that was put to be made and then sold uh, to someone else to put them together, like a cutler. So the structure of these is interesting. They are very similar to marks that we see in some of the Alexandria blades, those large group of 18s that uh, came out of Alexandria in uh, the later uh, Middle Ages there, a little bit after this particular sword probably. So we see these similarities, and then you can also see the broad width of the blade here uh, and the exceptional uh, roughness of the edge in a way, some of it from wear and tear probably in its lifetime, others probably a bit of corrosion from wherever it had its life between uh, being used and then ending up uh, being found. Uh, Ewart felt that it probably was indicative of this being an aquatic find, a river find as he would call it, uh, due to the difference in the patinas and corrosion on the different sides of the blade and such. 
One aspect of these types of blades is they do usually do have quite a significant distal taper. And here we can see some of the thicknesses on the blade. At the guard here, it's about 4.6 millimeters. But by the time we hit where the cog is right here, we've already down to 3.4 millimeters. There's quite a bit of taper to this blade as it heads down towards the tip. At the end of the fullers, we're down to 2.2 millimeters. And from there, halfway to the point is down to 1.7 millimeters. As you can see, that blade is getting quite thin as we go down to the tip. And then as we look at it just back from the tip, we're under one millimeter, 0.9. This tip of this sword gets very, very thin, but is still a very effective weapon. And we can see that most of the original kind of surface area is right there, where this is not due to a large amount of corrosion or grinding or anything. This was the structure of the blade. Another interesting aspect of the blade that we can learn from this piece is this bevel from where it is almost flat, or in, in some cases it almost seems to swale or be slightly fullered in the center, but hexagonal in cross-section, this bevel of the hexagon out on the edge here. We can set it and measure it, and it comes right in at about 11 to 12 degrees, but it does not come right to the edge. That is kind of a beefier section, and then it kind of rolls towards that edge, but it varies along the piece, probably due to somewhere, but also it was probably not a consistent style of bevel the whole way across. As an example, I've measured it in three different spots. One was our initial measurement right near the base of the fullers. Two is up closer to the guard within about where the cog is. And then three is right down near the tip. So you can see the variation in that angle coming down towards the edge. But all of these have space between the edge and that angle set in the piece. So you can see that they curve a little heavier as they get to that edge. One important element of looking at a medieval sword is to notice some of the asymmetries. These were all created by hand. It is not somebody exactly measuring each piece usually, so much as it is a craftsman working to create a piece that is what he is after but not worrying too much about symmetrical alignment. This was something that was kind of not worried about in the medieval period the way we do today. As we can see here, the bevels on the wheel are not symmetrical and the hubs of the wheel do not come out in exactly the same place on each side. Both hubs are set slightly lower on the wheel than in the exact center. And you can see slight irregularities in the actual circumference outline of the wheel itself. You can see on the second side that the hub is noticeably smaller than on the first. Also, if you look at the guard, the dimensions of thickness and things are similar but not particularly online. They are slightly different. Uh, the shapes, the sizes, there's a little more bend in one arm, which may come from its life, but could have been part of its manufacturer. And in fact, some of them will have a significant difference in the size from one edge of the blade to the other, and then slightly different from the center of the blade as well. So one final aspect I'd like to show on this sword is the fit of the blade to the guard. This sword is extremely good at illustrating how a medieval sword would be assembled as opposed to what we think of sometimes today where these blades are set deep in sockets that are very tight. Here you can see that the blade itself is just set down into a flattened area down through the guard, uh, a grind mark as it were, not even actually an inset. If we take the sword, and we rotate it around, you can see a little more clearly that it is one, not set straight to the guard itself, but also that the 
at corners of the blade, the shoulders stick out onto the flat of the guard actually, where there is no recess whatsoever. The particular fittings of a blade to the guard itself are one of the things that make a medieval sword kind of unique sometimes. And in this particular case, you can see that it was not something that was done with the uh, refinement of a machined piece. This is the construction of hand and eye from the medieval period. So I hope you've enjoyed meeting one of my teachers about medieval swords. Uh, learning about the period from the artifacts is an important aspect to the scholarship of weapons. We cannot find everything in books and in art sometimes. We have to look at the actual artifacts themselves and be able to see the craftsman's hand on the piece as it was made. And that tells us things that can then enlighten the things we learn from books or see in art or do research into records. All of those aspects have to come together to have a full knowledge and understanding of these pieces. That's one of the reasons the Oakshot Institute has been working so hard to put up 3D models of some of our pieces. The result is you're able to learn from the piece, even though it's virtual. I hope you enjoyed this little exploration of a sword and learning about how and what we do at uh, Arms and Armor and the Oakshot Institute. And I look forward to being with you in the future when you can come visit.